Every leader has a strategy. Executing on that strategy is the challenge. If you want to learn how to effectively achieve what you've set out to accomplish, then this show is for you. Gain keen insights and listen in as leaders share their stories and challenges. Soar Vision Group and the Baldridge Foundation welcome you to Leader Dialogue Radio. Hello, everyone. I'm Duffy Dix, and welcome to Leader Dialogue, brought to you by Soar Vision Group and the Baldridge Foundation. Joining me is Ben Sawyer. He's the Chief Executive Officer of Soar Vision Group. Ben has more than 30 years of executive leadership experience. He launched Soar to help align people with purpose and to achieve exceptional results. Lisa Council is the Chief Commercial Officer. She comes to Soar with more than two decades of clinical leadership and clinical informatics experience. She spent 19 years at the McKesson Corporation, leading large teams in clinical consulting, direct sales, and sales support. And our guest this week is Craig Clapper. Welcome, Craig. We're happy to have you. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Craig is a founding partner of Healthcare Performance Improvement, or HPI, and a partner at Press Ganey Transformational Advisory Services. HPI is a group that specializes in improving human performance in complex systems using evidence-based methods for high reliability organizations. Now, Craig has 30 years of experience improving reliability in nuclear power, transportation, manufacturing, and healthcare. He specializes in cause analysis, systems reliability, and safety culture transformation. You have led safety culture transformation engagements for Duke Energy, U.S. Department of Energy, Westinghouse, and many more. Welcome so much, and I know we have a lot of questions for Craig, don't we, Ben? We do, and and basically to get started, Craig, we'd love to hear a little bit about your background, your role at Prescani, and maybe for the listening audience, a little bit about what Prescani does. Sure, sure, I'd be glad to. You know, I, I trained as an engineer, and, and people often ask, uh, do, do you like the work that you do now, having left engineering? And, and my point is I never left. I'm still an engineer. I still use uh, technology to improve, improve, improve uh, sorry, improve performance. That's right. And I started this work in nuclear power, and then I worked in manufacturing, and we had some big clients, products that we, knew, we use every day. And then we worked in transportation, but nothing fun like an airplane crash or, or anything like that. It was usually small components or mm-hmm. rail. And then about 20 years ago, we had a, a client in healthcare that they wanted to look at patient harm events. And I didn't realize that it would take over our practice. So we reconfigured our group. We even called it Healthcare Performance Improvement. Four years ago yesterday, we became part of the Press Ganey family. Wow. Well, congratulations, Congrats. a little bit of a milestone. Yeah, thank you. So what was it about healthcare that was unique, given that broad brush experience that you've had in those other areas, that, that really kind of consumed the focus? Yeah, that's a good question, Ben, because uh, my family often asks, like, uh, well, how do you work in healthcare? You don't know anything about healthcare. <laughs> do they think you're a doctor? And the answer is no, I look how I dress. I kind of look like a drug rep. <laughs> But the, my point is, is in healthcare, the clinicians know all about clinical medicine and care. And when we worked in manufacturing, Dan and yogurt knew all about yogurt. And we, uh, like yourselves, don't really talk about the ins and outs of yogurt or steel or healthcare. Mm-hmm. We talk about how people perform in complex systems and how you can work together and improve performance in those systems, which I believe is very universal. Right. And And I know you do too. Yeah, I do. And and healthcare is definitely complex. I mean, as as organizational structures go, with all that's going on in healthcare, uh, it's a pretty complex uh, operational process. Yeah, you said it, brother, is that uh, healthcare is the most complex of the complex systems. And it's also the only one that's human-based is in in nuclear power, uh, we're primarily minding the machines. In in aviation, they they operate a machine. Those are machine-based systems. I know your work in manufacturing tends to be machine-based as well, and it tends to be more process and linear. Healthcare is more complex, it's human-based, and it's very non-linear. And while those other complex systems want to be high reliability in one dimension, safety, Healthcare wants to be highly reliable in several dimensions. They want safety, they want clinical quality, they want patient experience, 
They want engagement of caregivers and providers. They want efficiency yeah. and they want improvement. So they have the toughest paper route and they want to do seven times more than anybody else has done before. Which has made it challenging and a big reason why we have these kinds of discussions with healthcare leaders. So we had teed up, tell us a little bit about Press Ganey and kind of what Press Ganey does now and, and where you're going strategically based upon uh, the market and what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, Press Scaney, we're, we're a large uh, national healthcare firm. We work exclusively in healthcare, and we exist to improve healthcare. Improvement is part measurement, and it's part learning and doing things differently, hopefully in a, in a better way. Originally founded by two Notre Dame professors, Erwin Press and Rodney Ganey, and they were interested in improving quality, and, and somehow that got miscommunicated as satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And all the clinicians turned their back because they were more interested in quality than satisfaction. So over the last 10 years, we've been working diligently to return to those roots and have it be all about patients first and outcomes first. So we measure um, quality, we improve quality, we measure safety, we improve safety, we measure engagement. We're measurement and improvement. And I imagine every listener right now has some relationship with our company is that uh, we have so many uh, relationships with so many healthcare delivery systems, hard to pick somebody that, that doesn't do something with us at Press Gaining. So as healthcare is evolving and taking on more of a footprint, right? Not just the provider footprint, but in, in many cases the payer footprint, they're, they're managing pre-acute, acute, post-acute, digital health, all that kind of stuff. What are you seeing in terms of how Prescani is uh, addressing that in terms of the change in the market? Yes. Yeah, it's, this focus has really gone from acute care, the hospitals, to the big integrated system. So if you want to have excellence, you want to have safety and quality and experience, is that you do have to focus on acute care. And you should focus on post-acute care, like long-term care, nursing homes. But then there's telemedicine, there's home health, there's hospice, uh, the ambulatory care is huge. There's 25 times the amount of care outside of the hospitals as within. And, and that's why we think it's important to improve care across that full continuum. Right, and as, we, as you were t describing earlier, healthcare is already complicated. So as the footprint of healthcare and the addition of more and more nonlinear activities go on, obviously the complexity goes up. So from a systemness standpoint, what are some of the key things that listeners would want to be paying attention to from the standpoint of as organizations become bigger and more complex, what are some of the essentials from your experience that they need to focus on to ensure their success as a growing system? Yeah. Well, they are big and complex, and I think, unfortunately, to our shame, our work in performance and improvement in the past has just made them more complex. When I was a kid, the answer to everything was more policy, because there's nothing better than a three-page policy, but maybe a five-page <laughs> policy. <laughs> and then you can't, sure. you can't name anything better than a five-page policy. Right. <laughs> Ten-page policy. Yeah. <laughs> and luckily, we don't do that anymore. We switched to the electronic health care record. Now our answer to everything is a more complicated EHR. And what I admire about uh, your work at SOAR is that you're looking at excellence through reliability, which usually travels with simplicity, is that in the future, things must be more focused and more simplified to maximize the reliability of the users who practice at the sharp end. Another way to look at that is uh, traditionally in healthcare, quality was thought to be a competency of the individual. If you were well trained, your patients were safe and they got good outcomes. Uh, we gave up on, on that in the last 20 years as people have realized it's the work system. Right. Yeah, we have to have a work system to shape all that great behavior. So we have competent providers and caregivers, but now we have a work system. What we haven't realized is we can't manage the work system as healthcare leaders as a hobby. 
where every day we have our day job and then somehow we can manage this complex system in meetings. I think that, that's like pure craziness. So I'm looking for the next wave of solutions to become in quality management systems, safety management systems, give healthcare leaders systems to manage the system. Yep. So that's a great segue into total quality management, um, high reliability organizational performance, and ultimately a complete performance excellence journey. Because as you said, it's about focus and it's about orchestration and it's, it can't be a side hobby, it's, it's a main deal. And what's interesting is all the words he's been using are words we see on our hierarchy of needs. So for listeners, we do this every time. Um, if you go on to leaderdialogue.com, and that's D-I-A-L-O-G-U-E, if you go on to that website, the first thing you're gonna see is our organizational hierarchy of needs. And this is basically, you said how it should be simpler, it is basically, it looks like a flow chart, right? But it explains top to bottom how these components you've talked about, you know, excellence and quality and people on the front lines and the leader at the top. And it explains, I mean, he started talking about it and I, I must, I must be doing the show paying for a attention. long time. Ah, you're paying attention. It's, yeah. it's coming I, I in. Dream, I dream on the hierarchy of needs. No, but it really, what he's saying is sort of outlined here. That's right, and and it has become a visual Baldridge representation. So just to continue on with what you're saying, Duffy, for the listener, if you look on that homepage of the leaderdialogue.com uh, website, you're gonna find that the foundation is colleague engagement. Because if people don't understand how what they do connects to the broader whole and, and prioritize their actions to meet the prioritized action of the organizational strategy, it's a big miss. So it's that alignment, making sure you have well-trained people, good recruitment, good retention, that kind of thing. And that will lead to organizational effectiveness, which is the next part of that uh, pyramid. And then that drives customer value, all of the things that Craig has been talking about, all the different parameters of customer value. And ultimately the results, financial being one of them, are going to come from that. But at the, at the, at the top of that pyramid, is the strategy execution and the leadership to be able to make that happen. And I think that's where I want to transition next is the challenge of leadership saying no to multiple priorities and being able to focus is pretty difficult. Yeah, uh, you said pretty difficult, you know, very difficult or challenging is that if, if you look at what we're trying to do healthcare is we have to attend to all of those outcomes, the safety, the quality, the experience, and the engagement. Unfortunately, is we're, we're managing them all separately. In fact, we have a performance culture for every outcome. Absolutely. Right? And I think what we do is need to switch and have a, a nice framework to help us manage the system, but just have one system that uh, works to maximize the, the zero harm with 100% appropriate care, with a, a care experience that's connected for patients and family, but also has that uh, compassion. I think a big problem that we have is we lack empathy in patient care, not realizing that that empathy drives safety, connects us to patients and family, gives us better outcomes and improves the, the meaningful work of the caregivers and the providers. It, absolutely. And that was all from a trained engineer. That was, I, I well, that. and, and I being the nurse in the, in the room, you know, being at the front line, we've kind of known that for a very long time, right? But it took some, it, it took studies, it really took some proof and evidence in the marketplace to bring that, you know, all the way around. But I love how you actually bring the front line, you engage, colleague engagement is very big into the, into the hierarchy of needs. Tell us a little bit about how that colleague engagement um, really facilitates that high reliability organization that you always achieve in healthcare. Yeah, that, that's an important question because the engagement, as Ben had mentioned, is a great producer of performance, especially safety. And then safety in return is a good producer of engagement. Is that when we keep our people safe, that, that shows that we truly care for them and that drives that mutual respect. Together, engagement and safety are the best producers of quality. And if you can have a safe and high quality 
uh, care, you have your best chance of having a great patient experience. And, and that actually has a little name. It's called the virtuous cycle. Yeah. Where each one makes the next one better. I didn't know there was such a thing called virtuous cycle. I use the expression vicious cycle for years. <laughs> <laughs> we could all change it with one, with one slight It's a nice upgrade, <laughs> yeah, don't you a, think? The vicious is all bad, and uh -huh. everybody says that every day, but the virtuous cycle is the all good. Right. And I think that's the road to performance excellence, is you just have to run it from safety, quality, experience to efficiency. If you try to run it backwards and focus on efficiency, you don't get a better patient experience and you don't get better quality. That's a really important point. So let's keep unpacking that synergy because one of the things that's inherent in what you're talking about is the organization needs to listen well and understand what's actually going on, right? So this notion of frontline action being connected to senior leadership decision making in a very robust reactive sort of or interactive process. And we've talked about on previous shows that effective leaders understand that they have authority in their position, but they share responsibility with the front line. And in many cases, it's an experiment. In other words, based on what's happening on that given day relative to safety and experience, and, and efficiency and so forth, you may have to do subtle and, and meaningful adjustments, which is what your entire performance excellence system should be able to, to accomplish. So thoughts on that in terms of how it's done and some of the things that organizations and leaders need to be aware of as they're pursuing those four simultaneously. Yeah, my experience in, in working with healthcare executives is strategy deployment is probably our weakest uh, skill. Is oftentimes uh, when I work with a client, I think, well, what's our strategy here? And it's maybe like try to get through Friday and try again <laughs> on Monday. <Yeah. laughs> but I, I think we should be more thoughtful in thinking ahead about, well, what, what do we need to be successful? And then dividing that work up in ways that are very um, precise in communicating and measured well. And you can tell that uh, at each level in the organization, there, there's some synergy. Because you know, teamwork, you think about teamwork on, on the leadership team is, uh, healthcare does talk about teamwork, but we always um, seem uh, like the golf team at yeah. the like university. Indiv individual. Yeah, where our score is just, we add up all the individual scores. I right. think they need to switch to, what, you know, like a football? You want a football analogy? Or, That'd be great. Or hockey or whatever. They're <laughs> all they need to look more like that team Go where dogs. they pass the puck off to each other. Right. I think I heard the dogs over uh -huh. here, but. <laughs> I was buying for that Georgia yeah, Bulldog club, yeah. so I just made it myself. I didn't know <laughs> they played football up there. I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna look into this. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Oh, it's getting, oh, it's getting ugly this early? <laughs> but uh, the term I would use is orchestration. Yes. Right, where no one stands out. Like, like you can think of an orchestra. Right, you can have a great um, percussion section and a great, you know, wind instruments and you know, so on. But even though you might have really good individual players, the significance is when they all play well together. Exactly. So, are we still talking about healthcare? Because my twenty plus years of experience have not been a well orchestrated machine inside of hospitals. So, mm -hmm. when you look at the virtuous cycle, you know, quality stands alone, safety stands alone you know, patient experience stands alone. Efficiency, how are, efficiency often stands how alone. How are you actually getting those groups inside of healthcare organizations to come together and really be that orchestra that Ben is describing? Yeah, and, and thanks for getting us off the football thing. Is that <laughs> I like the orchestra analogy because it, it puts the executive as the conductor yeah. and it kind of implies there's gonna be sheet music. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's what we need in strategy deployment is let's let's get the, the music out there so everybody can play their role. And also, Ben, it brings up some points that you've shared with me on more than one occasion about uh, practice. Yeah. In fact, I think it's the band leader's paradox that doesn't say practice makes perfect. It's practice makes permanent. Right. So you need that feedback yeah. with some coaching. Yeah, so a, uh, an analogy or a reference that listeners may appreciate is Mr. Holland's opus, for those who yes. may have seen that. Mm -hmm. Love it. So remember, his, his whole intent for his career was to create his own opus or his big majestic, majestic. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, output of a musical um, 
tune and exercise. So what he did, though, is he was parked in a high school where everyone was a novice. No one knew how to play. And he invested in them, which was practice. They developed skills. And then if you remember at the end of the movie, they play his opus, which Spoiler is... Spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah. But it's fan, it's fantastic. It's the same kind of thing with leaders. You get back what you invest. Yeah. I think the, the movie parallel is exactly right, because remember, Mr. Holland thought his opus would be the music, and he didn't realize it would be the people. people. Yes. That's and the right. same is true for Dr. Holland's um, health care delivery system. Right. It, it's not his strategic plan. It's not even his outcomes for the year. Is that the CEO, their legacy is this high performing team that can do that uh, in the next year and the following mm -hmm. year. So I think the challenge for the healthcare leaders listening in is that can you take a system that, that you know has, has some challenges and can it be better when you hand it off than when it was given to you? So let's, un let's talk about some of those details. And we'll keep with the example of the orchestra. So with the sheet music, it's quite specific. You know exactly what you're playing. You know what's playing next. There is a clarity of role and execution by musician and instrument. Uh, but there is also um, very effective engagement and practice. And that means the synergy between the different musicians. So it's not just them practicing in a room off by themselves and then it comes together and voila, you have this incredible orchestraic you know, performance. No, they have to actually practice together. Um, so some thoughts about that, Craig, in terms of your experience, in terms of what do the listeners need to be thinking about to get to that level of high performance? Well, there, there are several an answers to that. I, I think maybe we'll start with a couple and see where it goes. Is I think we should acknowledge that leadership is a skill, and skill uh, comes through skill development, which training is doing right. with feedback. I think we're just doing too much education for leaders, hoping that they'll pick up on something and apply it. Mm -hmm. I think we should just be very overt in creating leadership operating systems. Exactly. Say, here's the way we're going to do strategy deployment. Here's the way I'm going to visualize my targets. Here's the way I'm going to organize my people around daily improvement. And that way we can grow up in a system. Right. And we can be more effective as a leadership team. Right. So you can't leave this stuff to chance. And another exactly. example that we use in daily practice that I don't think we've talked about yet on the radio show is we have a software application. Uh, the acronym of it is PULTS, which stands for Purpose-Led Strategy Execution and it is on people's phones, and it's, it's their strategy of the organization with their specific responsibilities, so it's tied by role, and it also includes the performance improvement tools uh, so that they can, as an interaction, say, well, this is what we're working on, this is what I was doing, this is what you were doing, where are we at with that, How, what does our performance look like, because that, that dashboard information is in there, and it, has, it turns out to be pretty important to give the individual participant feedback as to their alignment, how they're doing, and how to work together. Yeah, yeah I think that'd be a great innovation. It's, it, notice that it, the idea in leadership is to visualize. Right. Nobody said it was a visualization board. Mm -hmm. That was just right. our choice 10 years ago to make it a bulletin board. But if you can have it on your device, then you can coordinate your activity wherever you are in the state. Right. not just on the campus and right. give immediate feedback as you're completing task all of your team members there's immediate feedback there for leadership and for other managers and because what have we heard from frontline workers i mean i've been a frontline worker and it's great in the boardroom when they all come up with the strategy and what our goals are and what we're working toward i would love that information i would love to know what the goal and am i doing and be a part of it right and 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 let me buy into that and and that's exactly right so what i do on a daily basis i look if i can look back at what our strategy is i can clearly you know think oh i'm am i helping or hurting did what i did i do something that helped the company because when the company does well i do well let me buy into that and there is no feedback the only time usually you hear from your superiors is when you've done something wrong <laughs> how refreshing would it be to have someone say you're on the right track you're doing the right thing i'm telling you positive 
motivation, it has to be appropriate, it has to be true, you have no idea what that does to the mm-hmm. front worker. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To know they're part of a team. I, I think that is an innate thing human beings have. And your boss wants you to be successful. That would be <laughs> great. It would be great <laughs> if your boss says, I'm going to help you be successful, not you help me as the mm-hmm. leader be successful. Yeah, We're in it together. Yeah, listen yeah. for her reaction is I, I call her on the phone and I say, hey, if you have a minute, I have some feedback for you. Whenever somebody does that for me, I'm instantly <laughs> tense. I, what did, uh, what what did, did I, I do, do now? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my. Or in healthcare, you're waiting for the patient experience officer to come in and say there's been a family complaint. Again, that's just top of mind. That's what you think is going to yeah, happen. So two particular points in that. One, that feedback is often assumptive. Mm-hmm. So we've all experienced that where they come through with this is the feedback and you're listening going, what are you even talking about? Like <laughs> that didn't happen that way. Like there's a kernel maybe of truth in that. But do you want to start by let's talk about what actually happened, right? Which often mm-hmm. isn't there. And then the other thing is it it's never really clear what the expectation was because the strategy all the way down to the initiative and the action item wasn't clear, which then sets up the person for potential failure. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So that discourse is done much more effectively if you start with trust, which is that flywheel thing that we talk about, right? right? And basically what you're doing is you're seeking to exchange information and knowledge to understand how could we do it better? Like what happened? How could we do it better? Before you get to commitments of action and and then make sure that as you're talking about it, you're clear about what actually needs to happen. Yeah, very good. Yeah, we're you're talking about leader feedback. Optimal ratio is five to one. We should be five times more likely to affirm and reinforce good performance as we are to step in and help. And I noticed that some people try to change that one to constructive. It makes it sound like the positive reinforcement is not constructive. I disagree with that. But I think the the other side, we should just call it changing feedback. Yeah. And even there, uh, leaders need a specific approach to establish those things that you had mentioned there, Ben. Right, right. So leadership is complicated. And um, there are certain mechanisms that you and I have talked about in leadership retreats that we've done together uh, that leaders can focus in on. So, for example, one is what I call the 3P or sometimes 4P conversation with a leader with the front line. The first P is, are we aligned on priorities? Like in this little conversation that we're going to have, let's say it's a a quick Mm one-on-one. I have these with Ben every week, my four Ps. (laughs) Yes. Are we aligned on priorities? The second is how are people doing in your area? Are they they trained? Do do they have the resources they need to be successful? Have things been coming up from an experience or a safety standpoint that we need to be able to address? The fourth or the third P is process. So where are there inefficiencies? Is there anything we need to address there? Is there waste? Is there a way that you've been able to see that we could do something better? And the fourth P, if you do it, is place. Because often within an environment, the setup actually doesn't work. Like, for example, if you have case managers in a nursing unit right off the unit, but but where patients can hear them in the hallway, I've seen this before, that's a place issue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They, they can't have honest conversations because they're gonna be overheard. Yeah. So, so how do you essentially enable the performance by making sure they actually have the right environment or, yeah. or place? Ex- excellent approach because you're getting leaders to systematically look at the work system, which includes things like process and the environment of care. I think what we need the the listeners to uh, do is become their own systems engineers. There aren't very many systems engineers in healthcare, so every nurse manager needs to become a systems engineer. Every pharmacy manager has to be their own systems engineer. So they need to learn these principles and and then translate that into daily action through these uh, systems that that Ben and Lisa are, are talking about today. Everybody really needs these. The method is important. Everybody should be a Methodist. Right, and engineering <laughs> engineering is really a way of looking at things. It's taking it apart, it, making it logical, taking it apart. What are the contributional factors, and how do you yeah. make sure that you you know address those and compensate for it? Yeah. So when you say become a systems engineer, that's not a complicated thing. That's just 
a way of looking at something. It, it doesn't have to be. It just has to be insightful. The word engineer comes from ingenious. Yeah. Not very well named. It probably should have been called tedious. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what will an engineer tell you? I mean, my husband thinks like an engineer. It is. It is. It was. It was frustrating in the beginning, but it makes perfect sense. And now I think like that sometimes. And I think it's exhausting to always think like this, but it's amazing. Don't repeat the same stupid mistake twice. Don't get stuck in a loop. What is the most efficient, cost-effective, but also the most you know, something that makes the most sense, the biggest bang for your buck? I mean, it really is a way of thinking. So there's another mechanism in organizational leadership that's really interesting, and we'll tee this up, and then we'll start to, in our uh, deep dive next week, we'll talk more about it. But that is the whole notion of prioritized focus. Yeah. So we'll... In, in our parlance, we talk about something called a hoshin, which in Japanese means shine the compass. Uh, and, and essentially it says, do you always know what direction you're going in? Like what's true north? And then your strategic priorities need to make sure that they reflect that in a very focused way, mushing together a whole bunch of priorities because you think all of those are important, almost guarantees failure because there's too many of them. So in our deep dive session, uh, Craig, we'll, we'll tee that up and talk more about it. Uh, anything else for wrapping up um, this week's session in terms of introductions? Well, I'm going to just try to stick with two short thoughts. Is, is one is uh, I need everybody to get their hands around what they mean when they say patient experience. I'd like them to say it's safety, quality, and how patients and family experience that safety and quality and then get in the business of execution, is now how do you get your people aligned maybe through those four Ps to execute on that vision? Perfect. Good Thank homework. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Craig. We can't wait for next week. Thank you so much. And I love that these lessons are good for people outside of healthcare as well. Yes. Any business, big or small. Uh, we want to thank everyone for joining us on Leader Dialogue, brought to you by the Soar Vision Group and the Baldridge Foundation. Remember, you can listen to a new live show every Friday at 1 o'clock Eastern Time. You can visit businessradiox.com, or better yet, visit leaderdialogue.com slash podcast. On behalf of Ben, Lisa, and our producers, Mike and Trey. Trey is missing today, so just Mike. I'm Duffy Dixon. Join us next time on Leader Dialogue here on Business Radio X.